My name is Gail Giles Gidney and I am the very proud Mayor of Willoughby City Council and have been for the last five years and what an honour it is for me to represent this wonderful city that we have. And uh, someone else that's joining me from this wonderful city now is our second presenter, Greg McDonald. And Greg is the Director of Planning and Infrastructure here at Willoughby City Council. And he's going to provide an explanation of the planning process from city plans and zoning uh, through to lodging a development application. So welcome, Greg. Well, good evening. Um, as the Mayor said, my name is Greg MacDonald. I'm the Director here at Willoughby Council for Planning and Infrastructure. Um, we've titled tonight's um, presentation, Planning Made Simple. The reality is it's not, but I'll try to do the, my best to walk you through what is a fairly complex process. Um, as well as a number of staff members, I do have my manager of planning here because invariably somebody wants to outwit the presenter and it won't be very hard for you to do that tonight. So I've brought the experts with me. So if there is particularly difficult questions, I'm going to divert to um, some of the experts if I need to. Um, as I said, it is a, a complex process, but what I want to try and give you a bit of an overview about tonight is what's the strategic process we go through, first of all, as council planners and strategic planners? How do we actually work out what should be where? And then once we've worked out that, how do you actually go through the process of doing a development application and how do I make that, how do I chunk it down into sort of easy to do step by step process? Just as an indicator, who has actually lodged either a development application with this council or another council in the past? Yes. And if you haven't been through the process, you may have been a neighbour and you were notified that your neighbour was lodging a development application. So you've probably experienced from one of either of those two perspectives. So how do we make it simple? Interestingly, only two days ago, the professor at University of Sydney, the adjunct professor of urban planning, Leslie Steen, was quoted in the paper two days ago as saying, the New South Wales planning system is the most complicated in the world. Now, I can't com on, comment on that um, because I don't know all the other planning systems in the world, but I do know it is relatively complex. And some would argue that that complexity has given us a great planning system and ensures accountability and assures good planning throughout um, all of New South Wales. So I want to talk to you about the planning um, legislation and how that cascades down from a state legislative process all the way down to what council does. At the top of the tree, the primary piece of legislation in New South Wales is the Environmental Planning and Assessment Act. Below that, the state government prepares state environmental planning policies, or SEPs. These are generally um, planning instruments that the state wants to ensure have particular policy emphasis and are applied consistently across New South Wales. Below that, are local environmental plans and each council will have a local environmental plan of its own doing and I'll talk a little bit about the responsibilities further in a second and then again below that are development control plans. So that's the th four I guess main planning instruments and legislation pieces that dictate how planning operates within New South Wales. Now as I said the top two pieces are effectively state government controlled. The Department of Planning, Industry and Environment is the new mega department that's been created within the state government to look after planning and environment matters. And in Sydney in particular, we also have over the top of that, or beside that, the Greater Sydney Commission that provides strategic planning for the Metro Councils. So they both play a role in that space. I've drawn a line there because below that, these planning instruments are individual and unique to each council. So each council will have a local environmental plan and will have development control plans. However, I'm going to move the line down just a touch because the council doesn't have an entire say in the LEP. Whilst each one is individual, it still relies very heavily on state government approval for that LEP. So it can't do its own thing without the state government having some control and some influence in that space. So if we look at some of the things, and I, can you, I'm hoping you can read that, but I've just put a few examples of various SEPs that the state government 
has produced, and some of these are relevant, or most of these are relevant to Willoughby. Um, there are SEPs around affordable housing accommodation. Um, there is a certainly uh, SEPs around exempt and complying development, and we'll talk a little bit about exempt and complying development shortly. Infrastructure SEPs, um, senior housing SEPs, basics. If anyone's built a house in the last 15 or more years, you would have had to have complied with the basics requirements to ensure um, sustainability for the house has, has been maintained. Um, and Sydney Harbour catchment, because we're on the Middle Harbour area, we also have to comply with, with that. As I said, below that, within the LEP, are the specifics around what the zoning for the land use is, whether there's any heritage or conservation areas within the, the local council area that apply, height limits, and floor space ratios, which again, I'll explain a little bit further as we go. And below that, things that aren't included in the LEP but might be um, provided at a higher detail in the development control plans are what are the setbacks, whether there's, um, how do we control overshadowing, um, what sort of car parking requirements might be required at certain developments, what landscaping areas would be required, how do we manage tree protection, and what building envelope um, requirements go with each of the, the developments. If you've seen an LEP, you will know that it's full of maps, and I want to show you probably four maps, which are the main, I guess, uh, instruments that we use um, as, as strategic planners. That's called a zoning map. Each parcel of land has a different colour coding, and the pinky coloured area, which is probably the predominant um, colour on that, is the residential zones. And as you move into higher residential zones, those colours turn to a darker red. So you can see there's some darker red zones concentrated around the Chatswood area, the Artarman area, because that's where the main transport nodes are. So we've, as strategic planners, the housing and the higher density housing is concentrated around where the facilities and where the infrastructure already is. Out on the peninsulas, there's um, less um, Trans public transport, but there is um, different, and, and I guess different um, zoning requirements as you get further out there. There's industrial areas. I'll try and use this pointer on the big map. You can see the Artarman industrial area is coloured that that um, bluey, purpley colour on the the map, and the higher commercial zones, obviously around the Chatswood CBD, and some of the local centres have got the blue zones. So each one, um, each land piece of land is colour coded depending on the zoning. One of the things the strategic planners do spend a lot of time is working out what is the right mix and where should those colours go so that we get housing in the right spaces, we get the commercial areas in the right spaces, we get the industrial land in the right area. And as you can imagine there's a lot of competing needs for all of those areas. We've got demands on our industrial areas. People, um, or developers, want to use that land for other purposes. We have demands on our commercial zones for residential space. So we need to try and determine how best to share that usage around. And as part of that process, we've undertaken a number of strategic documents over the last 18 months to two years, including our CBD strategy, which is how the CBD, Chatswood CBD will be developed over the next 15 or 20 years. We've been working on our housing strategy and our employment zones strategy and local centres strategies. All documents that consider what the future of those spaces are, how the land will be used going into the future, what the infrastructure needs are required to support those areas, and how do we get people uh, to get a high quality of living life so that you can still live in your residential area but be close to um, facilities and close to the, the, the things that you need. That's not the only diagram we use though, as well as the zoning map, we use a floor space ratio map. This may not be as familiar to you. In effect, it talks about this combined with our height map provides a guide to the type of bulk and scale of development that you can achieve on your land. Now, in very simple terms, if a, floor, if a pro property has a floor space ratio of 0 0.5 to 1 and your property is 1,000 square metres, 0 0.5 of 1,000 is 500 square metres. 
So a floor space ratio provides the ratio of floor space to the total site area. Now because of various offsets and other controls, you may not always be able to achieve the full floor space ratio in one level, so you may have to go to two levels or three levels or four levels depending on the type of density that's being allowed. So you can see on some of those scales, some of the, the numbers get up re relatively high and there's, you know, figures of the order of, you know, 20 in the 20s to 1 by the look of it. I'm thinking it's a bit hard to read but that's, that's in that order. So, sorry, seven to eight, seven to one, eight to one. I was misreading it. So, so as the floor space ratio increases, the bulk of the, the development increases, and that has to be read in conjunction with height maps. So we can control the, t the actual height of a development, and again, you will see that height in the CBD is much higher, and if you read off those scales, you'll see that the various heights in the CBD are higher, and in the, some of those local centres than it is in the surrounding residential areas. So these are some of the mechanisms we use to control the type of development that can happen on the, the site, the bulk of the development and the height of the development. And finally, we also have conservation areas. There's 13 within Willoughby and in essence they're areas that have higher heritage or conservation values. The homes have generally got an aesthetic um, appeal to them from a particular era and we're trying to conserve that, that appeal and ensure that any other development that happens in the area is in keeping with the surrounding area. The result of that is it's generally probably more stringent controls in those areas than it is in other areas that don't have conservation areas. So the question becomes what is development? Well the Act says it's the use of land it's the subdivision of land, it's the erection of a building, it's the carrying out of work, it's the demolition of a building or work, or it's any other act, matter or thing referred to and controlled by an environmental planning instrument. So in essence, it's anything you do on a parcel of land. There's not much gets through those filters that doesn't become, that doesn't fall into the development category. So it doesn't make things much simpler when you're trying to think out whether or not you have development. If you're doing something on your land, generally you can consider it as development. So then the question you ask is then, well, if, if it's development, do I need an approval? And the answer is not always a yes. Sometimes you can still do development on your land without approval and I want to walk you through um, probably the four most likely scenarios that will occur when you're considering development on your land. What I've done though is I've also included for when this is uploaded onto our website, there is a web link there. You'll see it's our Will Willoughby Council website forward slash development forward slash development application process. If you go onto our website and you go to that link, you'll have, um, there's quite a number of pages there that will guide you through the development application process, what information you need, how do you go about it, who do you talk to, and, and I'll cover that in a few of these slides, but that's a really good link. If you don't remember anything else tonight, remember that link or come back to this presentation on our website and click on it, it'll take you straight there. So the first process of the, f the four that I said I'd talk to you about was exempt development. As I said, not everything needs a development application and sometimes if um, you're doing a clothes line or a kid's cubby house or a small shed, um, you can go ahead and do that. It's called exempt development, you don't need any approval. There is also complying development and that is where the use is allowed under the zoning and the LEP controls but all you need to do is apply for a certificate, a complying development certificate. It means that the development fully fits in to all of the controls we have and there's no need to actually lodge an application. The certificate is sufficient. You can do that two ways. You can come into council or you can go through a private certifier. The types of development that this would normally fall into would be a swimming pool, as I've put in the photo. Um, it could be a new home, provided the home wasn't in a conservation area and provided that home fitted into the, f uh, the planning um, instruments that we've, and the controls that we've put in place. If you don't fit into the complying development process though, 
The next step is to actually lodge a development application. So this could be either a home within the conservation area, it could be an addition to an existing home, or it could be a, a, a bigger development other than that. But I'm sort of talking to the homeowner type developers at the moment. The fourth process is where you're trying to do something that is prohibited. And that might be um, something where somebody wants to build um, high density flats in a low density residential area. That's just prohibited. So the fourth, fourth one is actually a big red cross and w you wouldn't be allowed to proceed with that type of development. So where do you start? First thing is to know what do you want. We're happy to help you, but we can only give you a vague answer if you've only got a vague idea of what you want to do. So you need to be clear in your own mind what it is that you want to do on your land, how big, you, how big a development you want to do, how many, room, uh, bedroom, uh, how many bedrooms or the like um, dwelling you might want to build, so that when you come to us we can give you the best advice we can. Well, how do you find out what the specific controls that apply to my site are? You can go onto their website, and again, the website's there, and that will tell you what the controls are. You can go to the LEP, you can look up the DCP, you can also talk to people. You can talk to council staff, and we will guide you. And there's a number of professionals in the industry that have set up exactly to do this role. Architects and planners that do this for a living, so you can engage them and they will, they will know our LEP and they know what can be done. So who do you speak to for help? Well, those people I've just listed, and as I said, council staff are available to assist as well. Should you meet with council officers? That's up to you. You don't have to. It's not a requirement. But if you've got a more complex development application, my advice would be make the call and come in and see us. There is a fee for a, a pre-DA meeting, but it's sometimes money well worth spending because you get some very clear information from our staff in a, you know, a half hour, one hour meeting, or whatever it takes to actually walk you through the DA that you're proposing and give you some guidance as to what the requirements from our end will be. And how do you know what information will be required? Well, again, I'm not going to go through it all, but there's a checklist, a nice easy checklist on our web page that will tell you everything you need to do. So you don't have to turn up here without knowing what's required. You go to the checklist, make sure you've got all the checklist information, the drawings, all the documentation, any of the studies, any of the um, geotechnical information you might need to submit with your application, bring it along, make sure you've ticked off all the checklist. When you lodge it, it makes for a much easier lodgement process. Which leads me to the process. Now, I don't want to take you through a complex um, chart, so I've simplified this down, but when you come into council, you will bring a, a number of documents with you and you will, do, you, you will lodge your development application with council. At the moment, you lodge it over the counter, Within the next 12 months, we're looking to have electronic lodgement, so you'll be able to lodge it from home through an, a website portal. The first thing we do is assign it to a planner, and then we put it on public notification. We will advertise that for a number of days, and it will depend on the type of application, but typically 14 days or 21 days, and we will let people know that we've received the application, and it's an opportunity for people who are either neighbours or close by or just have a particular interest in that development to have a look at the documentation that's been lodged and then they can write to council and make a submission to council. Whilst that's happening, we're not sitting around waiting for all the applications to come in. We're talking to our own internal staff, so it's going off to the development engineers to um, consider what development requirements they might require. It's going off to our environmental staff to ensure that the environmental aspects have been addressed. Our planners are looking at it from a planning point of view. And we're also sending it off to state government authorities. It could be Transport for New South Wales, um, could be EP, um, EPA, um, any, any um, state government agency that would have an interest in this particular development because we want to get their views on it as well. Once we've got the public submissions back and all the internal referrals back to the planner, we start to collate that information and start to consider all the information we've got from the application and the comments that have been made. 
We then develop an assessment report um, which goes th through a number of checks and the first check is whether or not the um, criteria for referral to a panel are met. Now I'll explain that as we go. But if it doesn't meet the criteria for a panel, it's generally a, a more simple application or a, a run-of-the-mill type application wouldn't tr uh, trigger those um, referral requirements, in which case it can be dealt with at staff level through our own delegations and dealt with through that. If, however, it does trigger some of the criteria, and the, the, the biggest criteria probably for triggering is how many submissions we, we receive. So if we get a lot of submissions, it generally goes through this additional um, rigour of going through the panel requirement. We also do a second check on whether it's state or regional significance. If it's not state or regional, it will go through what we call the Willoughby Local Planning Panel, and that's a panel of independent experts that will assess your um, application based on the advice from the officers that have prepared the planning report. If it is of state or regional significance, it goes to a higher panel called the Sydney North Planning Panel. They all do the same thing. They, at the end of the day, they will either make one of two decisions. One is they will approve the development application with conditions, or they will refuse the application. So what happens after that process? Well, if you've gone through a complying development process and you've got a refusal, the most likely reason is because it didn't fit the criteria for complying development and the, you really needed or you should have applied for a development application. So if you do get a refusal on a complying development, applying for a DA is normally the, the next step and you can go through the DA process. If, however, you've been approved, you're allowed to start work and away you go. If you've been through the development application process and you've received a refusal, there is a review process, so you can seek a review, or you can choose to go through the Land and Environment Court for a determination from the court. If, however, you've been approved, you can go through the, uh, you, you need to obtain the, the construction certificate and away you go, you can commence. Now, I know I've tried to make that as simple as I can. The reality is there's a lot of complexities in all of that process, but I've tried to keep it to a very, very um, simple level. There's probably people sitting here tonight thinking, well, I've just had an application or I've gone through that and I had to do X or I had to do Y. There's going to be a whole heap of nuances around each of those that would probably um, mean that some of those processes that I've explained tonight may not be achievable in individual applications, but probably the majority would go through those, those, um, that chain of development process. I also want to talk to you a little bit about developer contributions. One of the things we always get asked is how do you cater for infrastructure and growth? So as more and more people are coming into the city, how are you going to deal with that? One of the ways we deal with that is that the developers pay a contribution towards the additional impact they have on the infrastructure so that the residents or existing ratepayers aren't paying for those developers to take up the, the capacity. As an indication, over the next 15 years, we're expecting growth to be in the order of about 6,300-odd dwellings, more than 11,000 uh, 11, residents, and probably in the order of about 8,000 jobs. As I said, each that growth requires development, whether it's in upgrades to our parks because there's new families coming into our area. It could be upgrades to community facilities, to buildings, to sporting facilities. Um, in some instances, it could be um, upgrades to uh, footpaths or cycling facilities to ensure that we provide for that going into the future. That all costs money, and as I said, we don't want to burden the residents or existing ratepayers with, with that burden. The developers pay for the additional benefit they get from um, bringing new people into the area. So the contribution rates, depending on the type of development, it's um, structured such that you pay a contribution in, a, in an increasing value depending on the number of uh, bedrooms you have in a dwelling. So a small studio or a one bedroom dwelling would pay $11,000 up to a three bedroom house which is capped at $20,000. That's for residential. 
If you're not doing a residential development and you're doing a commercial development, it's based on a percentage. Now, it's 3% if you're in the CBD, in the Chatswood CBD, or 1% if you're outside the CBD. So, th and that's based on the development value of the, of the works. Now, I did say that um, if you tried to build something that was outside the, the zoning, that was the end of it. The reality is there is another mechanism called rezoning, or it used to be called rezoning because it was really about changing that zoning map. And you might have wanted to do a higher development, dense, uh, higher density development in a low density area. In the old days, you would apply for a rezoning application to change the zoning of that land. We've changed the name a little bit. It's more, um, it's around planning proposals now because it's not just zoning that changes. It could be the, the floor space ratio that I talked about. It could be the height or it could be a combination of things. So rezoning, whilst we still hear that terminology, technically isn't the true terminology anymore. We call them planning proposals. That's where it gets complex. That's where I'm gonna stop tonight. But I just wanted to let you know, there is a process that if developers seek to do a planning proposal, they can come and they can seek to have the zoning or the FSR or the height changed so that they can do something that's not currently in our, in our um, planning instruments. The reason it's complex is because we've gone through a fair bit of work to get to the zonings that we have now, so we don't take lightly a change in planning controls that would allow something greater than what we've already discussed with the community. So part of that process is quite a lot of um, community consultation and talking to the community about what their thoughts are on various planning proposals before we go through that process.